Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. Can you believe it's snowing again? It's a really nice kind of snow, though. It, it kind of covers the grass and not the road. Covers your car, but not enough to really scrape it off. I, I could do with these kind of snows, like once a year. It'd be nice. Even if I lived in Florida, I'd be good with this kind of snow. I'm glad to see you guys braved it through the half-inch snow and made it here. Hopefully worship was good for you guys, because it's a lot of work. For all of these guys that are up here, I can tell you, I can tell you because my fingers hurt from practicing. And uh, I don't do this all the time. I'm just a substitute teacher. And uh, I'm, I'm blessed to have Rocco around when he can be around and do what he does with the team because it's, uh, it's meaningful. And it prepares our hearts for the word of God. It prepares us for God to plant a seed in us. And that's what I truly desire today is that the word of God might mold us and make us more into the image of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Because other than that, this is just a performance, which would be worthless. But when it sinks down into our hearts and it bears fruit, it's worth something. Before we get started, let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is that we can come to you, that you have cleared the way for us to be justified, <clears throat> not perfect, but justified, that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, to take the punishment that we have earned and that you did it without any thought to your own safety, truly a reckless love. I pray, Lord, that you would teach us to receive it well, that we would live a life that is meaningful and filled with purpose for you. And Lord, at this time, I pray for me that you might use my words and that I might convey and preach the message that you would have me to preach. Lord, I pray for us, all of us who hear your word, <clears throat> that you would change us and make us like you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> well, last week we talked about stewardship and I was absolutely insane and thought we'd get through 31 verses. <laughs> and so we stopped halfway through and we looked at uh, this story that Jesus tells about serving him with everything that we have. That, that means our finances, that means our energies, that means our talents and abilities that God's given to us, that really our life is about him. It's not about us. Amen? Okay. So it's a little slow in the amen. Okay. Just so you know, this is where we began in chapter 15. And Jesus is talking about a lost sheep. He's talking about a lost coin. And he's talking about a lost son. And we went over that in chapter 15. Last week, we talked about money. And that's always a great topic. And believe it or not, the people who visited last week for the very first time came back <laughs> after I talked about money. And I, I don't like talking about money, but when I come upon it in the scripture, I have to. Because that's, that's a rule. I have to talk about it. No servant can serve two masters. Either will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot make them equals, and you cannot take money and make it first, because then God is not. God always needs to be first in our priority list. And so we talked about that. This week, we're going to talk about the same thing, because I didn't get through the whole story. Just to remind you what, what it was about in the first half of the chapter, he also said to his disciples that there was a certain rich man who had a steward. And an accusation was brought to him that the man was wasting his goods. You guys heard me harangue for a long time about how I hate waste. So he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be a steward. Do you know that's going to happen to each one of us one day? You're done. All your stuff isn't your stuff anymore. I'm bringing you home. We're going to see what you did with it. That's the bottom line of all this. The steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. 
In other words, I can't work it off. And I'm ashamed to beg because he's got a pride issue. I have resolved what to do. That when I am put out of my stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him. And he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And so he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and write 50. Gave him 50% off. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. He gave that guy 20% off. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. It's an interesting oxymoron on how you would commend an unjust servant. And yet that's what Jesus did. Even though he did what was wrong and deceptive, he goes, that's clever. I wish my people would do the same. I wish they would liquidate all debts that they possibly could. You know, there are people that you might be mad at and unforgiving of and you might be holding on to. Why not just settle that debt Amen. before you stand before God and have to give an account of your stewardship? Yep. Just saying. I didn't say it last week. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. Sounds like buying friends. That when you fail they may receive you into an everlasting home. It says, use your money to make a way to be able to share the gospel with those who don't know him. Because what an opportunity is that? Amen. He was faithful in what is least is also faithful in much. And he was unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, by the way, that's filthy money because you don't know where it's been, who will commit to you the trust of true riches. And if you have been faithful in what is another man's, if you have not been faithful in what's another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either you'll hate the one and love the other, or else you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things and they derided him. The Pharisees heard this and they knew he was talking about them. He's talking about us. And it kind of ticked them off. You know, when somebody says something to you and there's something that you need to learn from it, you should be a bit more open-hearted than these guys were. And if you realize that you're a lover of money, you should be willing to lay it down because it's going to eat your flesh like fire and judgment against you at the end. So, we're back to stewardship and we're going to pick it up with the Pharisees who were lovers of money. You know, being a lover of money is not a strange thing to us in this world, right? How many of you guys know what's happening this afternoon? Some of you do. Okay. By the way, it's Super Bowl Sunday. There are billions of dollars that people are betting on these games with the B, billions of dollars. I won't ask for a show of hands <laughs> or even what you think the spread is, unless you got an inside, no, never mind. <laughs> the Pharisees were lovers of money. And you know, people in this world have been trained to be lovers of money. In fact, when you have children, you tell them the most important thing you can do is get an education so you can get money. And then if you're a woman, you don't have to marry a man. You don't need no man. Because you got money, you see. And a man needs to make money and lots of it because if he ever plans on getting married and having children and having all the stuff that he wants, you need money. So we've been trained pretty well. In fact, the American dream is that you can do anything you want so you can make lots of money. And it's an interesting thing how we're trained to make money the priority. The, the reason that we train up our kids the way we train them up is so that they can get an education and make money. The reason that you get an education is so that you can get a better job so you can make more money. It's an interesting thing. Is that the most important thing that I've given to my kids? 
That's what the world would tell me to do. And they can become lovers of money just like the Pharisees. And when you read through the scriptures and you go across one of these speed bumps, one of these parables, it, it's kind of painful. But I start to check my life and say, am I a lover of money? If I put that in the place of God, is money my God? Is that my object? Is it my comfort? Is it stuff? So the Pharisees were the religious rulers of the day. They were all about the way it looked. They were about what people thought of them. Uh, they enjoyed all the high places and the feasts and you know the important places. That's what they were all about. And when Jesus talked about this, about the stewardship being taken away because they were wasting it and they didn't care about anybody but themselves. That's a sad, sad situation. <clears throat> In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it talks about all the characteristics of what's going to happen in the end times when Christ comes to take us home. One of the things is men will be lovers of themselves. Well, we don't see that. Lovers of money. It, it, it means actual, it means silver and me are brothers. It's actually what it means in the original language. A lover of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and it continues on. And there's a whole list. And there is not one of those characteristics that you will find that doesn't exist in our world right now. Right. Now, there was a time when those weren't the important things around World War II or so. There were, you know, family was important. There were other things. But my goodness, money has become the god of this world, unfortunately. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tells us this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. That means don't be a hoarder. Right? Just nod your head. Just doesn't mean you can't have a bank account. It means you don't store it up. You know, what it is, you know, like you can't walk through the house. There's just this little path because you got stuff. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Because you could lose that stuff, right? That's the that's the problem with stuff. You lose stuff. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wherever it is that you're putting your money, those are the things that you'll care about. I always thought it was the other way around. The things I care about are the things that I give money to. No, no, no. You want to you see an interesting thing? When my, my, car, my wife's car just broke down. Everybody went, oh, oh, oh. yeah, because you care. I know you do. And so I had to stop in the middle of an elder meeting and run out and go rescue her. And uh, Carl was kind enough to help us. And it was, it was all messed up. Took it to the mechanic, paid him lots of money, and now it's fixed. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> the wonderful thing is when you turn and it starts, there's joy. <laughs> because where your treasure is, your heart is also. I love that car more now than I did before I put $600 into it. <laughs> Isn't it like that? Remodel your house and put a bunch of money into it and suddenly you don't want to go anywhere. You want to stay home. It's snowing anyway. Why not stay home? It's where you put your money that your heart goes. So the question is, where do you put your money? Because wherever you put your money, wherever you put your investments, that's where your heart's going to go. And there are some places my heart shouldn't go. And so I don't want to be investing in those things. I want to be investing in the kingdom of God and sending it into heaven. Oh, verse 15. And he, meaning Jesus, said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. He's speaking to the Pharisees who loved money. And he says, you guys love to be justified. You love everybody to like you and say nice things about you. And you, you're big on money. Money's like your God. They used to rip people off and they used to use religion as a cover for it. That sound familiar? People are still doing it today. You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. You remember the parable where Jesus tells a parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. And he says, these two men went into the temple to pray. The Pharisee walked right up front and he prayed to himself. 
And he says, God, I thank you. I'm not like other men, thieves, murderers, or like this guy. <laughs> Can you imagine a prayer like that? That's why he's not praying to God. He's praying to himself. And the tax collector wouldn't even approach the front. He stood back and he beat his chest as he bowed before God. And he said, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Jesus said that man went home justified rather than the other. They try to justify themselves in front of people like this man did here in Matthew. Or I'm sorry, the book of Luke 18. <clears throat> Matthew 6, Jesus tells us that when we're going to do a charitable deed, when we're going to do a good thing, make sure nobody knows about it. It's a secret. Like yesterday when I gave... A thousand dollars to no. Do you see? You see how useless that would be for me to mention that, to talk about you know, what a nice guy I am and how much I give and. But people do that, don't they? They get little bricks with their names on them. They get hospitals named after them. Wings of libraries named after them. And Jesus says, when you do a charitable deed, when you do a good thing like that, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Keep it a secret. Why? Because then your heavenly father will see it and he will reward you for it. But if you do it publicly, you've gotten your reward. So you did it so people would see you and say, oh, what a good person they are. Jesus says when you're doing a charitable deed, make it a secret. He says when you're fasting, you know, when you're depriving yourself of food and you're filling that space with time with God, seeking God about something, when you're fasting... Don't do it like the hypocrites do. He's talking about the Pharisees because they disfigure their faces. You know, they, they mess up their hair and they go, oh. and you go up to them, you say, hey, what's the matter, man? Oh, oh, nothing. I'm just fasting. I mean, it's been 12 days. I, I'm, I'm fasting. It's a charade. They're playing a game. They're trying to put on a performance for you. And he calls them hypocrites, which the word hypocrite means you're an actor. You're a pretender. You're putting on a face, you know, and it's not really who you are. Jesus says, you hypocrites. When you fast, wash. That's a good, that's a good word for somebody. Wash when you're fasting. Comb your hair, you know, make yourself look good. If the barn needs paint, put some paint on it, you know, make up whatever you need. And don't appear to people to be fasting because you're fasting before God after all, right? It's not a performance for people. Jesus says when you're praying, don't stand on the street corners and pray out loud for everyone to hear because that's what the Pharisees did. He says when you pray, go into your closet. I don't know how much room you have in your closet. But... My house is kind of small. I can think of other private places, and that's the point. Go into a private place where it's not a performance for anybody. It's between you and God, and God who sees you in secret will reward you openly. If you're really doing these things for God, you're going to do them in secret, and it's going to be who you are. It's not going to be what you pretend to be. And you see, that's the problem with a lot of religious organizations. It's about a performance. It's not about a relationship. And Jesus wants us to have a relationship. In fact, that's what all of this is about. Amen? Amen. Just wondered if you're tracking. I think about David when he was king, way before he was king. He was the youngest of a family full of boys. Can you imagine raising a family full of boys? And Samuel was said, make sure you go to this guy's house. When you go to the house of Jesse, the next king of Israel is going to be there. And Samuel's like, oh, good, it can anoint a next king because Saul's really not doing well. He was the people's pick because he was a head taller than everybody else. It's not much different than the way the world chooses people. <clears throat> but here's David, and there's a party for Samuel because he's coming to anoint somebody king, and there's a party. And so he walks up to the first guy, and he goes, oh, certainly that's the next king of Israel. He's tall, he's handsome, he's on the cover of GQ. He's awesome. And the Lord speaks to him and tells him, 
and reminds him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So imagine you're Samuel, you're going to go anoint the next king of Israel because, you know, we're done with Saul. He's, or he's, he's bad news. He's doing hideous things. And so you go, to an, you go to anoint the first, the eldest, and you go, certainly this is, no, okay. What about the second one, Lord? No, don't look at his stature and don't look at how handsome he is either. And yeah, I know he's got college degrees, he's got a PhD, he's, he's not the guy. And he goes all the way down, boom, 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 boom. And he goes, you got any more sons? No, that's it. Oh, wait, <laughs> like an afterthought. Oh yeah, I got one more son, I totally forgot. But he's, he's a runt, he's the kid. And the kid's out watching the sheep while this whole party's going on. He wasn't even thought of by his parents enough to come to the party. You, you feel like you're a little left out. You feel like you're a little abandoned. You feel like, you know, your parents don't love you. Imagine how David felt. He wasn't even worthy to be at the party. David shows up, this young boy, it says he was a ruddy, uh, he was a, like, a, like a tough and tumble, dirty, little rascal sort of kid who comes in and the Lord says, that's him. Can you imagine being Samuel saying, are you sure? Because that's a kid. You want this kid to be the next kid? Yep. Don't look at his stature or his outward appearance. God looks on the heart. That's the next one. So this little kid shows up and he goes, okay, let's get with it. God said so. Let's do it. It seems unreasonable, but I'll do it anoints him with oil and says, you are going to be the next king of Israel. And it was several anointings later and years later, about 13 years later, where he actually took the throne. But he was selected long before he grew up because God knows the heart. So the Pharisees aren't like that. They justify themselves before men, but God knows our hearts. Verse 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Now he's talking about John the Baptist or the baptizer because he wasn't in a denomination. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. How many of you are confused by that? Yeah, I was confused by it. So it's just the two of us one day. It's Here's a, here's a parallel passage in Matthew. This is the way Matthew takes it down. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. What? You mean they're invading heaven and it's suffering violence? I didn't know you could do that. It's, it's good old fashioned language that we get tied up in. What it means is that people are using energy and time and resources and actually seeking out the kingdom of God. They're pressing in, not violence like you and, under, you and I understand like Marvel comics and you know, it's not that kind of violence. It's somebody pressing forward with the determinism and it's actually the same parallel word, violent later on. It's people are pressing in and the Pharisees remember were critical of Jesus because he hung around all the prostitutes and the tax collectors and all of the, the, there were lepers that came up to him and he healed them and they were like, what's up with that? And we're not supposed to have anything to do with these guys. And so all of these people were coming to Jesus and there were all of these crowds that were all part of that. And the Pharisees didn't want anything to do with it. And he says, the kingdom of God is preached uh, by the way, that's, that's evangelon. It's a, it's a word which means to evangelize. It's to go out and tell the good news. That's what's going on here. And people hear it and they respond to it and they're pressing in on Jesus and they seem to be everywhere. But not the Pharisees. They were all about themselves. They weren't about seeking God. They weren't about listening to the teaching of Jesus. They just sat there and wanted to judge. You know what it's like when People are there just to kind of judge you. They got that face. You know that face. Yes. Maybe you have that face, but it's, you know. <laughs> Pastor said something I don't like. I'm going to write this down. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. See, you don't see it because you're looking this way. I, no, I'm sorry. The kingdom of God has been preached until John. 
And all of the crowds, all of these people are pressing into the kingdom. These people are responding to the good news. And Jesus has said some very difficult things to them. And they're like, I want to hear more. <laughs> it's like, you, to be my disciple, you have to leave everything. They're like, I get that. But everything I have is kind of worthless. So that I got nothing to lose. But when you're rich and you worship money, there's a whole lot of stuff that you're going to have to leave. So, Matthew 21, 31 says, Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. That's what he said to the Pharisees. Harlots and tax collectors are entering the kingdom of God and they're pressing in and they are finding the kingdom of God because they realize they have a deep need. You, because you worship money, you have no need. You think you have everything you need, but you walk around hollow. And so the harlots and the, and the tax collectors are going to make it to heaven before you. I would have loved to be there to just hear Jesus say that to those guys and look at their face. How does that feel? Because they're pretending to be something they're not. Verse 17, Jesus says, And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one tittle of the law to fail. By the way, a jot and a tittle is uh, essentially their little accent marks, uh, much like a comma or a period on top of an I or a cross across a T. So it's like one of these little accent marks in, in the Hebrew language. And he says, not one of these little bits of the law are going to go away. You know, you guys are, you guys think that you're going to get saved by obeying the law and you can't obey the law. Nobody can. Anybody live a perfect life? Got it down. You got, I live perfect life. Perfect. Nobody can say anything bad about me. I've never uttered a syllable that has harmed to any human being. In fact, I've never even stepped on an ant. I don't destroy anything. Yeah, okay. And yet, he says, not one little jot or tittle of the law is going to pass until, uh, un until the end, obviously. But he says, it would be easier for the law to disappear than for it to fall to the ground unfulfilled. But in Revelation chapter 21, if you've read the end of the book, I'm gonna, this is a spoiler alert, guys. Revelation 21.1 says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. It's the same language we use for death, right? Isn't that interesting? Also, there was no more sea. You see, God is going to come and make everything new because we've ruined it. <laughs> and he's going to make it all new and without sin. And in chapter 21 of Revelation, last chapter, we get a, a view of that. And so Jesus is kind of speaking forward into that. Then he mentions this interesting verse that seems to be out of nowhere. Verse 18, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Wow. Wow. Jesus, after stating that the law is not going to be changed, even though Jesus is saying some things to them that are kind of very different than the way they understand it, he says the law hasn't changed. You guys have. God laid it all out simple a long time ago, and you're the ones who are breaking it. In fact, they were saying, if your wife burns your toast in the morning, you can divorce her. If you find somebody that looks better than her, you can divorce her. It's all written down. It's an amazing thing. I, I wish I had the documents for you. It, there, if she speaks unkindly to you in public and embarrasses you, you can divorce her. These were the Pharisees' laws about divorce. And Jesus says, none of the law is going to go away. And by the way, anybody that gets divorced and marries somebody else is committing adultery. Now, Jesus goes on and expands later on in the rest of the scriptures, and I'm glad for that because there are probably a lot of divorced people in this room who are saying, oh no. Jesus says, you, you think divorce is for any reason, but there's only one that Jesus recognizes as a valid reason for divorce, and that's adultery. And by the way, it's not necessary. I know people, I know a lot of people who have committed adultery and learned their lesson, went back to their mates, and they straightened it out, and they worked it out, they trust each other, and everything is good, and Jesus brings healing. 
So it doesn't have to be divorce. But Jesus said, if, if that intimacy is violated at that level, I can understand why you would get a divorce. And there's definitely somebody at fault. Uh, it's definitely somebody's fault. It's not like, well, we just grew out of love. How much money are you spending on her? Oh, nothing. So I'm mad at her. Well, that's why your heart isn't in it, because you haven't spent any money on her. Spend some money on her. Buy her a gift already. Take her out to eat. Because where your treasure is. Okay. Yeah. My sister up here is saying, mm hmm. That, that's right, Rocco. You better. Jesus says you authorize all sorts of breakings of the law, like adultery. If you get divorced and you don't have a valid reason for that divorce, you are still married. You got to go back and straighten it out. Unless there was adultery involved. And it's not necessary, by the way. So, and if, and if you marry somebody that was divorced illegally or unbiblically, then you are causing them to commit adultery because they're still married to the other person. God's plan for marriage, one man, one woman for life. Like it or not, deal with it. I've been dealing with it for 38 years. Don't you smile at me. My poor wife has had to deal with me for 38 years. She's got to be, you, th you think I'm all fun and games up here. I'm not. So Jesus says, you guys authorize all sorts of breakings of the law when it's convenient for you, but you guys are off. You're off the rails. This is a textbook example of how people ignore foundational biblical truth for convenience. And Jesus says, if you're going to come to me, you have to come to me, all of me. You see? And that's the agreement. You have to give it all if you want it all. You can't say, well, I'm just going to add Jesus to the recipe of my life and put him into the soup of my world. Well, Jesus doesn't, he doesn't play that. Either he's everything or he's nothing. Mark 13, 31 says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus said there will be an end of all things at some point in time. But the things that he says are going to endure for eternity. So the thing that we're studying and the thing that you've taken time out to be here and hear about is going to be forever, even after this life. Now, that's a pretty good investment of your time, don't you think? I'm going to try not to mess it up. Verse 19, Jesus is going to tell us a story. It's not a parable. It's a story. Because a parable, there are no names. Like if I told you a story and say, John Graham, the other day, went outside. This is a real story. This is not a parable. If I said there was once a man, that's a, that's a parable. It says here, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Who's he talking to? Pharisees. The Pharisees who are dressed in purple, and they eat sumptuously every day. Sumptuously. I'm not talking about like, okay, so you went out to eat once a week and you had steak. Okay. That's one thing. Every single day, he gorged himself on the finest foods that were available. I don't know how many of you wear purple. I don't see anybody with purple, but I, oh, I see a purple hoodie. That, that, that qualifies, my friend. <coughs> But it's usually a sign of royalty or the priesthood or importance. Uh, today, it's just fashionable. But you get the idea that this rich man, he had everything that he needed. He was dressed with the finest, in, in fact, linen, which comes from flax. Very, very soft on the skin. Very nice to wear. If you guys, no, you don't care. So, and he feasted sumptuously every day. Usually, if you're rich, you show it because of how wide you are. It's an interesting thing. Psalms gives us a bit of a perspective from God's point of view about how we should view those who are rich. Psalm 49, verses 16 to 20 says this, do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Notice there's a dissension. Though while he lives... He blesses himself. By the way, that's what the story is talking about. This guy's blessing himself. For men will praise you when you do well for yourself. 
He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. A man who is in honor yet does not understand is like the beasts that perish. You see, it doesn't matter if it's Elon Musk or, or any of the richest people, Bezos, or any of the guys that you can think of, it's all going to go away at some point in time. And it's funny, most of those people don't have good relationships because they're not priorities. Not everyone, but most of them. Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> the disciples said, well, Lord, How's anybody going to make it? If the rich aren't making it, who, who apparently are blessed of God himself, how's anybody going to make it? And he says, that which is impossible with man is possible with God. So how do you, you know, I mean, other than putting a, a camel in a blender, I don't know how you get it through the eye of a needle. But <laughs> Verse 20. So we, we've got the rich man. Jesus is going to contrast him. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Now he's put a name to this person. This isn't just a certain rich person. This is now a certain person. Jesus is telling a story. And I wonder if he's talking about somebody in the room. If he's talking to one of the Pharisees, he's talking about perhaps somebody else who was here. A certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at the gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So you get the picture, right? He's a guy that gets dropped at the rich man's door in hopes that the rich man will do something. The rich man does nothing. In fact, he wipes his face and he dusts himself off and puts the crumbs on the floor. And the guy looks on, emaciated and hungry, and says, I, I wish I could eat those crumbs. He's got sores all over his body and dogs occasionally come by and the only hospitalization he has is that the dog licks his wounds. You get the, you get the idea, the rich man is a very different person than this guy. And Jesus is doing a contrast on purpose. And I think he's telling a story of a, a literal thing. In Luke 12, 15 to 21, it says this. And Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. By the way, that's this desire to have more and more and more of what you already have enough of. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And then he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. He thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? And so he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and I'll build greater. And there I will store all my crops and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, because that's how we talk to ourselves. You have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You can retire now. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be in which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, we went through this previously when we were in chapter 12. This rich man is all about him. He's not about anybody else. In fact, there's a guy right outside his gate he could help, and he hasn't done a thing. So you guys get the picture, right? So it was that the beggar died because the stats are that 10 out of 10 die. You know that, right? Yeah. It's the one of the two things that you never talk about. Taxes. Death and taxes, that's right. The beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Notice the details. The poor man dies and angels attend him. It doesn't say that he was buried. They probably threw him in, in the Hinnon Valley, which is a big garbage dump that was constantly on fire. And that's where a lot of people ended up, just being kind of one, two, three, and 
into the fire and they get cremated and you walk away and hope that you're you know upwind and you don't smell their flesh burning but the other man the rich man was buried proper burial probably lots of people hearses all in a row with their lights on and they could see it and he was buried probably with lots of pomps and, and circumstance that is the Taj Mahal by the way you know what the Taj Mahal is for it's a mausoleum it's for a dead guy yeah so the rich man was buried doesn't say anything about his soul but the angels come and take Lazarus to meet the Lord can you imagine that breathing your last and being poor like that and waking up between two bouncers with wings because angels aren't these little cute cupid things they're they do serious battle. One of them killed 185,000 <laughs> by himself. So, and takes them, takes him to heaven. And being in torment in Hades, the, the real pronunciation is Hades, but it's Hades. He lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, which tells me he's Jewish, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, if any of you are familiar with the teachings of Charles Taze Russell, None of you know who he is. Yeah. He's the guy who started in, in 1856, he started the Jehovah Witnesses. They don't believe in hell. They don't believe that there is any side effects from the way that you live. And if you die, you just get eliminated. God has a button and he just goes, and you have no eternal soul. Gone. No punishment. So Hitler got off. It's all good and a lot of other things, but they don't believe in hell. They don't believe in an eternal soul either, but I'm getting sidetracked. He cried out and he saw, and he cries out. Here are some other scriptures that talk about this place. In Daniel chapter 12, verse two, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Everlasting contempt means it's lasting forever. So it's not annihilation. Press a button and poof, your soul doesn't exist anymore. God created you in his image and he breathed into you the breath of life and you now have a living soul. That is an eternal thing that will outlast your body. You're a soul that is occupying a body. You're not a body that has a soul. You're a soul that's occupying a body. And it says here, there'll be everlasting shame or everlasting uh, life. In Mark chapter 9, verses 47 to 48, Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Well, he can't possibly mean that. No, that's what he means. Jesus means a literal worm. In fact, they had a place called Gehenna, which was also synonymous with hell. It was the garbage dump where everything would go. And there were all kinds of critters living off the things that were in that stack. The worm never dies. You are an everlasting fire and the worm never dies. This is a place called Hades or hell or Gehenna. Psalm 9, verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. I'm just grabbing some sample verses just so that you know that Charles Taze Russell was whacked. Okay? Revelation 20, verse 14. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. There we go. We're back at Revelation chapter 20, which is the end of the book. There will be a judgment 
and those who have not accepted forgiveness for their sins, that have not accepted the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, will have to stand before God on their own merit. And none of us has any merit, do we? Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. But Abraham said, son, it's interesting he calls him son. It kind of makes me unnerved when somebody other than my father calls me that. Son, remember that your lifetime, you received your good things and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Jesus is saying that there is a separation and there is a destination. You're going to arrive someplace and there's no changing it. You can't wait. <laughs> you can't wait until after you're dead to say, oh, oh, all that stuff that Jesus, about Jesus, that's all true. Okay, well, sign me up. Where do I sign? No, it's appointed unto a man once to die and then the judgment. It's too late. There's a too late for everything. Jesus, speaking to the men on the cross, one on either side of him, they both began, if you read all the gospels together, they both began to mock Jesus who was in the middle. And Jesus was doing what Jesus does. He says seven things at the cross, if you want to look it up. One of the things he says is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. About the people that put him up on the cross, the people that were mocking, people were spitting, saying, if you're really the son of God, come down off that cross. And he prays and he says, Father, forgive them. Don't, don't hold this against them. They don't know what they're doing. Would you be praying for the people that hung you on a cross? Jesus did. And apparently everything that's being said and everything that's going on, one of the thieves is watching and thinking and he comes to believe in Jesus that he is who he said he is. And he says to Jesus, Lord, he calls him Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. How did he know that? He maybe went to a church service one time. <laughs> maybe he heard a sermon of Jesus. Maybe, maybe he heard conversation as Jesus was on the cross. But he knew that there was a kingdom that Jesus was in control of because he calls him Lord. And that's all this guy says. He doesn't get baptized. He doesn't take membership class. He doesn't fill out an application. He doesn't get, you know, doesn't take the Lord's Supper. He just believes. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Because to be apart from the body is to be one with the Lord, if you know the Lord. And it's a place called paradise. So I don't, I don't want to separate paradise and Hades and hell and, and heaven. Uh, it's another study another day because uh, we're running out of time. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And it was a simple faith of a man believing that Jesus was who he is and accepting him at his word. And that's what got him saved. Simple. We make it very complicated. You got to bow down. You got to get up. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to be on your knees. You got to give alms. You got to, you got to read the Bible every day for at least an hour or you, you might not make it. That's a religious stupidity because you don't make yourself go to heaven. You accept a free gift. I will answer you in 10 minutes. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 27 to 28 says, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. And he's going to take everything and he's going to fold it up like, like, like a bad map and it's all going to go in the lake of fire. And he's going to make everything new. And I don't know about you, but I want to be part of that number. And then he said, 
I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him, meaning Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brothers that they may testify to them, lest they also come to this place in torment. So the rich man says, hey, if he can't dip his finger in some water and come over to me and put it on my tongue so I have some relief. You see, that's the only thing the guy can think of is his own comfort and his own relief. Now he's thinking beyond that because that's not going to happen. He says, well, I've got five brothers and I don't want them coming to this place. As much as we fought and as much problems that we had, I don't want them here. <laughs> Send Lazarus. Send him there to tell my brothers about this place so that they don't have to come here and be tormented. Tormented, not annihilated. Tormented. Second Peter. This is a lengthy passage. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, yes, hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world to the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust for punishment in the day of judgment. You see, the scripture just assumes that everybody understands this. There's going to be a reward and there's going to be a punishment. And it has nothing to do with what you, what you supply. It's everything that God does and whether you receive Christ or not. It's just that simple. And if God is in the middle of sorting all this out, then he knows how to deliver us, doesn't he? Just like he took Noah, got him in his boat and lifted him up and it was five months in that flood. So he'll do with us. I don't know if you noticed, but they're taking people out of Kiev. Any of you watch the news? Any of you? Any of you awake? Okay. They're taking all of the embassies. Um, England has taken all their people out. Australia's taken all their people out. They're encouraging all Americans out of the Ukraine, and they're shutting down all the embassies. They're bringing all, the, all their people back to their prospective countries because it looks like there's going to be war any, any day now. You know the Lord's going to do that for us. One of the things you do before you wipe a place out is you call your people home. Just thought I'd share that. So, Abraham said to him about this wonderful missionary idea that he had, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham. This, this guy's arguing with him. But if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. So if I send Lazarus back and he's resurrected and I send him back and he preaches to your brothers, this guy with sores and the dogs lick his sores and he's emaciated and he's outside your gate. If he comes back from the dead, they're not going to listen to him. They're not going to listen if somebody comes back from the dead, if they don't listen to the scriptures that are already written. So, it says here in Galatians 3.24, therefore, the law was our tutor, that's the, the, the law meaning the Old Testament with Moses and the prophets, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. It's by believing and taking Jesus at his word. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So the law has served its function and we're not about, well, I got to do the right thing and I got to do the good thing. And if I don't, God's going to be mad at me. And if I don't read my Bible this morning, he's going to be so angry. He's probably not going to let me breathe or something or I'll get COVID. And people have this whole cause and effect thing down in their head. And that's not the way God is. My sins are taken care of because Jesus came and paid for me. He paid for all my sins, past, present, and future. I'm free. And I'm not a slave to the law. I will do it because it's God's expressed will and because I love him. 
Not because I'm told, oh, you better do it. God's going to be mad. Oh, I'm telling. That whole thing is done. Jesus tells them this story and he says, even if one comes back from the dead, they won't believe. He's foreshadowing his own resurrection. Do you see that? He's saying, if they don't believe the law and the prophets, they won't believe if somebody comes back from the dead. Well, the somebody who's coming back from the dead is standing there telling them the story. And I think that's pretty neat. Jesus has a pretty cool sense of humor. So, chapter 16 of Luke. There, if God hasn't created punishment for the wicked, then he is unjust. It's like a judge that everyone that goes before me goes, <laughs> it's okay. Commuted. And lets them go. How many people you murder? Oh, you attacked all those police officers? It's okay. Don't do it again. Psh, commuted. And you just let these people go. Does that sound like justice to you? Everybody loves justice, just not on themselves. You notice that? I'm tooling down the road and I'm going 75 and I go, uh-oh. Better slow down. Somebody goes flying by me, I'm like, I wish there was a cop. You better check your own speed limit there, buddy. <laughs> if there is not a punishment of the wicked, then God is not just and he is not loving. If there isn't a reward for us doing what he's told us to do, then, then God is unloving. I hope you guys find this maybe a little disturbing <laughs> <laughs> and yet comforting because God has made a way through his son, Jesus Christ, for us to be forgiven of our sins and to have a new life. Amen.